Welcome to this edition of The High Strangeness Factor, copyrighted on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. I'm your host, Steve Ward. One of the reoccurring themes on the show is that of high strangeness areas, portals, vortices, or as John Keel called them, window areas. We've been doing a, a series of shows that have dealt with uh, and will deal with one of these locations that lay in southern Wisconsin, among other related topics. And first, I want to uh, introduce my co-host tonight, Andy Mercer. Great to have you back. Yes, it's good to be back on again. It's um, hopefully get a bit more frequent now than it used to be. Hopefully that's going to continue to be the case. Um, I had a bit of a minor emergency today. As you know, my microphone started not to work for a while, but I've got it working, hopefully. <laughs> so well, people people that, have, that have real jobs, I mean, real jobs just get in the way of this fun stuff, you know. Oh, I know. Tell me about it. It's, it's really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and Brandy, we're, it's kind of, we're getting to, uh, this is getting to be a habit now, which has been a lot of fun. <laughs> And uh, what I want to want to say is that uh, uh, you and I are, are doing kind of a series of shows that uh, have dealt with and will deal with uh, the Bray Road area, one of these high strangest areas that uh, Linda Godfrey really started writing about with the Beast of Bray Road and uh, with that first book about these upright canids. But there's so much else going on. And uh uh, so we've been talking about that sometimes exclusively, sometimes it'll just be one aspect of the show. But uh, uh, but our guest tonight is going to be somebody that can really tell us a lot about her experiences and about this area. But first, Andy, please tell us about your uh, your new YouTube channel. Oh, yes, yes. Um, I think I attached it to the last show at the end, just mentioning I've got this finally up and running. It's been something I've been planning probably for a year or more thinking about it. In fact, the first inklings of the idea was a couple of years ago, but I finally launched it. Um, basically, it's a short um, YouTube video where I analyse ghost video footage from around the world from various social media platforms, YouTube, obviously, and things like Twitter and Instagram and all that. Um, there are a few channels that do this kind of thing. They compile short collections of best ghost videos on, on YouTube, and that sort of thing. But I try to go into a little bit more detail. I try to offer a bit of analysis. I don't say whether I think they're real or not. That's very much for the audience to decide but it's just to give you a chance to look at some of the things that perhaps sometimes even the original uploader might have missed themselves i finally put the very first one up on halloween which i thought was the appropriate time to start it's gone pretty well actually I had quite a few views i've got quite a few new subscribers so it's called the cryptic files cryptic files and if anyone searches youtube for the cryptic files you'll find it um the next one will be going up Probably on Saturday, in fact, I had a little poll on my Facebook page where I should put them on Fridays or Saturdays, and Saturdays is winning. So the chances are this Saturday coming, there will be another one. And the idea is to put one up one a week, certainly for the time being, perhaps more frequently if I can build the channel a bit further. I've got quite a few already pre-made, so there's a nice stock of them in the background ready to rock and roll as soon as I can. So, yeah, it's, um, it's something I wanted to do for a long time, and so far, so good. People seem to like what I've done so far. Now, the upcoming one is going to be uh, Mark Johnson's? Oh, no, that will be a little bit later on. I do oh, have okay. a clip from our glorious leader, Mark Johnson, who has sent over a few, and one in particular really caught my eye. So I'm going to be working on it for a little while, but it will be included in one of the uploads at some point in the near future. But now the next one's coming up. It actually involves an investigation that I was on. So. Ah. <laughs> There's a bit of one there for um, it's 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 been on another channel before because we sent it into the guy who runs one of the he sort of channels guy called Sir Spooks. He put it up, but mine's a little bit long with a bit more detail because to say I was actually there. So that's that's in this week's and another one from a very interesting clip from an English ghost investigation team that seemed to have captured something in a person's house. I won't say much more about it. So people will watch it, but it is really intriguing what they seem to have captured. And I say if if not, I don't think they faked it. I don't think they're the kind of people who would fake it. So if it's genuine, it's pretty good. So we shall see. And of course, Mark is uh, one of our fearless leaders here at the network. So that, that'll that be interesting. But uh, uh, Brady and I have seen your, your first video. And uh, you do, you, you go through it, you narrate it, you point out things mm. that uh, that b both the, probably the, uh, the, uh, the people in the video have seen, but stuff that you notice yourself. But you, you're right, you don't... Uh, you don't uh, make any pronouncements about what is real mm. or not. You let the, the viewer decide that. Very much so. And I, will, I invite people to comment in the comment section as to whether they think it's real or not. I mean, I won't um, agree or disagree with any opinions 
um, put forward by people, it's their own opinions. But yeah, I mean, I want people to say what they think and let me know. So also, if anyone has any clips that they know of or they've got themselves that they think would be interesting, um, please let me know. So you can message me on, on the Cryptic Files, just leave something actually on the page. I've, I'm working on um, a YouTube, well, sorry, a Twitter and Instagram account for it, but they're not set up just yet. But they also set up an email address, which um, I've got, but for some reason, I can't remember the password. <laughs> <laughs> I said it up some time ago. So oh, that never happens to me. One. Oh, it's, it's so annoying. I've tried everything I could think to actually get it back, and I can't, can't get it. So I'm going to have to set up a new account. But that will, the idea will be that people, if they've got stuff they think it's worth me using, um, let me know. I, obviously, I can't guarantee I'll use everybody's clips. I mean, one thing I don't want is anything to do with orbs and that sort of stuff. I mean, it's a controversial topic, but most kind of thing that maybe they aren't real so i'm going to avoid those but anything that looks particularly strange i mean it's, it's predominantly ghosts but i've got some more what you might call possibly ufo type of footage as well so i'm open to anything that looks a bit strange and mysterious but um ghosts seem to be the popular thing so that's why it's on the main thing i've been working with i'm beginning to think i should just use the simplest uh, password possible and you yeah. use it for everything and just take a chance. Yeah, that's the thing, of course. If we figure out for one thing, it's the same for everything, you're in trouble. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Okay. Well, let me uh, introduce our guest for today. After learning that the Beast of Bray Road and other cryptids were right in her own backyard in southern Wisconsin, Donna Wells Fink went on the hunt. That was in 2011 and she's still out in the woods and fields, experiencing the unimaginable. In her adventure, she has run across dogmen, Bigfoot, UFOs, orbs, gremlins, and even a wereboy. Having interviewed and talked with many eyewitnesses of cryptids and UFOs, she knows to expect the unexpected. Donna can be found on her YouTube channel, interviewing eyewitnesses and researching locations of sightings. She has two paranormal groups, Beast of Bray Road, and Southern Wisconsin's Wild Ones, Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, and recently hosted the first ever Beast of Bray Road Conference 2021 in Elkhorn, Wisconsin. Donna is also writing a book on her paranormal adventures. Donna, welcome to the High Strangeness Factor. Thank you, Steve. Uh, first, I will talk a little bit about, uh, 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 I went to your conference and was was uh, privileged to speak there. And uh, I had Brandy was with me also uh, at my table. I looked like a, a real professional with a helper at my table. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, we, it, was, it was really a good time. I mean, Brandy and I just had a blast and uh, a lot of interesting people to talk to, uh, a, a lot of interesting speakers. But I, I have to ask you, how uh, how early did you decide to uh, try to create this conference? Um, it was probably May of 2021 when I decided that it's time somebody celebrates the beast. Um, he's so famous worldwide. And I have people contacting me from France and Ireland and all over the world about the dog man and the beast of Bray Road. And I thought, well, if I don't do it, I don't think anybody else is ever going to. So I decided to have a conference and... Um, it turned out really well, and it was so great to meet everyone. Well, we had, I know we had somebody there from Texas. But there was somebody there that flew in from Maine. So, yes. you know, that was, and plus, I'm sure there was some locals, but, uh, and it's not not too bad. Uh, it wasn't bad, uh, too bad of a drive for Brandy, I know. For me, it's uh, it's not that bad. I have, you have to get around Chicago. That's always a, oh, a chore. Yes. But, uh, but uh, yeah, it was nice to have something, uh, if not quite in my backyard, almost in my backyard. So, uh, uh, and uh, it must have been gratifying. I mean, it was a successful conference and not all first conferences are successful. So how did you feel about that? Well, I, you know, I know it could have gone better um, and I think it will each year that I have it. And um, I know there's things I could have done differently and better and but my hope was just that we get to celebrate the beast and people that are interested in him uh, get to be able to get together and talk to other people and I think they had a good chance to do that in between the speakers and especially because sometimes the uh, the flash drives weren't working real well and <laughs> yeah. they all got a little more time to shop um, at the 
uh, vendor tables and to talk to uh, people like yourself. I thought that was really great. Well, I, I thought it was a very successful conference, especially for a first conference. So I, I, I would have been, uh, I would have been pleased as punch if I had run it. I would have felt really good about it. Oh, thank you. I tried. Uh, yeah, well, you did, and it was, it was, it was, uh, it was very successful. And you couldn't really have fit too many more people in the uh, conference no. area. Oh, so I'm it, it was. Have it, it was in good. A bigger place next year. Well, that, that'll yeah, that'll be good because uh, I really think it will grow. Um, yeah, I just uh, I can't uh, I can't imagine me doing one of those. I would uh, uh, I'd, I'd be all gray hair, all white hair, which is well, I got, it, it was hard because every speaker that I had booked early on, every single one of them canceled on me. And oh. then I saw that you were coming, but I didn't know who you were until somebody else. Maybe it was Jody Cook or someone. I, I think it was Brian Siege. Oh, Brian. Yeah, I yes, love Brian. Yes. yes. Um, it was Brian. And I thought, well, if Steve's going to be here anyway, I would love to have him as a speaker. And I had no idea the depth of your knowledge. And I was just so happy to have you and well, everybody I, that I ended up with. Well, yeah, it was uh, we had a, a nice group and I, I really appreciated uh, being there. So uh, let's. Uh, Let's start out and find out a little bit about you. Are, are you uh, somebody that is uh, uh, a sensitive? I mean, do you pick no. up on the? OK, OK, no. <laughs> you and I, you and I are in the same canoe then, buddy. Let me tell you. <laughs> oh, I'm as dumb as a box of rocks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> you have to hit me in the head and then I go, oh, well, maybe that's something. <laughs> yeah. I, I've had one weird experience, which I won't bore people with again, but that's that's about it, you know. Uh, so you, when you were a, a, a kid, you weren't uh, uh, seeing dead people or or no. getting weird cosmic vibrations. No. So, so so what led you? Uh, we all had had our paths, and it was, there's was people that are experiencers that want to seek out what this stuff is. There's people like you and me that came into it other ways. So so how did you uh, come into this interest? Well, you know, I had seen uh, Bob Gimlin and uh, Roger Patterson's film, you know, when I was young. And I put that in the back of my mind and I thought, well, why can't that be real? Why is everyone having such a fit about it not being real? And it looks real to me. But I put that aside and lived my life until the early 90s. And on one of the television programs was Linda Godfrey talking about the Beast of Bray Road. And, but my kids were younger then, and, you know, I didn't have the, and I was working, and I didn't have the time to go out in the field, and I didn't have anyone to go with, and I wasn't going to go by myself, so um, it wasn't until 2011, um, I had read in her books of a sighting that's near my home, and I figured out exactly where I think it crossed the road, and I started there at the neighbor's house, and sure enough, she had had a sighting. And the, her son took us into the woods next door, and there was a huge shelter. And it's been nonstop. It's been nonstop since then. Let's uh, paint a picture for people that uh, that may not know the area at all. Where uh, where would we say Elkhorn is? Uh, it's in southern Wisconsin, obviously. But what other landmarks would you give somebody that doesn't know where? It's it. in Walworth County, which is um, southeast in um, in Wisconsin, and it's very south. We're probably maybe a half hour from the border with Illinois, and then it's very far east. It's further east than Rock County, where I live, but it's only about a half an hour from my home. So um, we also would go out to uh, Bray Road. But you can't really stop there because the police will come and get yes. you. Away. Yeah. Did you notice that? Well, uh, uh, Brandy and I took a stroll, a, a, a nonchalant stroll down Bray Road. <laughs> and uh, we, we knew we knew that uh, uh, I, I have been there once uh, a couple times before, but I parked about a half mile away at a, at a shopping center that was signs up that says, that uh, we will tow your car if we don't like you. So, <laughs> oh, so it was it was like a half mile to get to the road, and then 
I, the, the first time I did it, I, uh, I I had my I still had my winter legs. I hadn't been out that much, so it's my first long spring jaunt. And man, that night my legs uh, uh, were were uh, uh, under severe stress. I guess, but uh, oh, right. not so bad this time. Park there because the police will come and have you move. Yeah. And so you've got to park somewhere in a parking lot and then walk a distance. Well, well, uh, Brandy and I, I won't say where we parked, but we got permission okay. <laughs> to park on, on private property. Oh, yes. And so, but we had to walk, uh, and I'm sure you know where I mean. So we had to walk uh, down a particular road. What What do you think, Brandy, a half mile to get to? Um, uh, it could have been. Yeah, it could have been. Uh, 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 route 11. I want to make it sound as long as possible to make yeah. people think I'm, <laughs> you know, uh, resilient. Uh, but uh, and then a, a short jaunt on uh, I think Route 11, and then we were there at Bray Road, and we were there on the uh, I guess you'd call it the east side, where uh, where the weird stuff happens. And so and let's let's tell people uh, Bray Road when I the first time I drove there. Uh, I didn't actually walk it. I, I got out and took, you know, the obligatory picture of the Bray Road sign. But uh, I, uh, it, the sun was going down, and I was in Elkhorn, and I'm looking at the map, and I'm trying to figure out where the hell this place is and how to get there. It's a little, little tricky to find the entrance to Bray Road. It's, I think, about four and a half miles long, yes. and then it, it comes to, it ends at a T on the east side. And it comes off of, I forget what route, but it's a, one of the main uh, routes that come out of Elkhorn. So you, you'll you want to, uh, it, it might be a little tricky to find it the first time. But I just kind of wanted to give people kind of a perspective. Now, so you, uh, uh, it, it must have been pretty uh, interesting and exciting for you to have this this local Wisconsin author talking about these weird sightings at some place so close to your home. Oh, absolutely. I thought... You know, every every monster that had to be had to be out in the uh, yes. Pacific area. Hopefully, you know. Yeah. You know. <laughs> no, it's exciting to know they're and actually they're all over. I mean, they are all over. People would be so would just die if they knew how close they are to all of us. Donna, <laughs> how long had you known your neighbor before you became interested in Linda Godfrey's reports and discovered that your neighbor had had a sighting too. Well, she wasn't my neighbor, but I knew the area. Oh. It was out by Lima Marsh where she had had, where there were sightings of Bigfoot, okay. but this was Bigfoot. Um, oh, wow. But Dogman, but Dogman has also been seen in Rock County here where I live. He, he's been seen all over southern Wisconsin, and I'm sure northern Wisconsin, there's no doubt he's they're up there too, but um, they're seen all over southern Wisconsin, and the first area I started in was Lima Marsh area. It's a big um, marshy area with woods and ponds and um, just the perfect place for creatures to live, and so that was in um, we started looking in 2011. And then, you know, when we were looking for Bigfoot, then we were also looking for the dog man. And of course, we'd also go out to Bray Road. And, but it's just, it was so hard until I met Lee, uh, Lee Hample, it, to do any kind of investigation around Bray Road because you can't stop there. Um, you have to park your car somewhere and walk for a couple of miles. Um, and which we did, but, you know, of course, we never saw anything. And until I saw Lee's uh, video where he was being followed by one singular white orb type light, um, did I believe that he actually had something going on on his property? Wow. Um, because what? that had happened to Jackie and I. Oh, OK. Well, we'll get to that. But wasn't. Uh, wasn't Lee on some some show? I don't know what it was. Some paranormal show. Yeah. I, mean, I think maybe the. Do you know which one that was? Do you remember? Well, he's been on Expedition X, but he's okay. also been on other other programs. He's been on several. Okay, good. I don't uh, remember the other ones. Well, originally Linda Godfrey wrote about him in the. Uh, I've got it right here, Monsters Among Us, which one of his yeah. one's one of her subsequent books, and he yeah. was under there under a pseudonym, and there uh, and there uh, 
they were talking about how uh yeah we'll get more and more into uh to Lee's stuff later but we'll talk a little bit about them now and later on when we start talking about the photographs we uh you brandy and i have seen these so we will have to use andy to try and make sure we're explaining what these amazing mm. amazing images look like so okay. if so andy if you don't know what the hell we're talking about just speak up not a okay. clue <laughs> <laughs> but we will, we will try to explain these images and it's it's just one of these amazing hot spots but uh let's uh yes uh uh lee's lee's journey is uh we'll talk a little bit about him he uh started setting up these trap cameras and he started uh, chronicling these strange myths i remember oh by the way brandy mm -hmm. you and i were at the uh dogman symposium Yes. Several years ago. Yes. We didn't know each other then. No. But I was there too. You were there too. Oh uh, my gosh. I'll bet you I'll bet you Andy was hiding in the back and he just hasn't said anything. <laughs> I think that's probably the one person who wasn't there. I'm afraid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll be darned. Okay. So but there that's where uh Linda was showing some of those images of yeah. the mists and so forth. And that must have been Lee's property. Oh, that's right. Okay. I didn't yeah, that, remember that, but yeah. But anyway, he was talking just in the in that uh, that one book, Monsters Among Us, is talking about you know putting out this roadkill and uh, and then it uh, it disappearing and uh, and there are and Andy there are pictures of carcasses of deer and so forth on his property and you can see the timestamps on the photographs mm -hmm. and some time later there might be a mist there might not be but then the carcass is gone a short time mm -hmm. later there's no footprints or drag marks how mm -hmm. the hell does that happen so uh but yes yeah, so no that picture on trail cam either right yeah. right it's 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 like the trail cams are are managed somehow at, at certain points but uh it, it only talked you know so much about uh his uh, experiences the one thing he did tell us he said now he's a, a scientist he's a mathematician he told linda godfrey when he discovered you know when he was finding these weird images on his property and he got a hold of her because she had been writing about this stuff uh mm -hmm. he told her he said if i had encountered one of your books two or three months earlier i would have thrown it in the trash <laughs> because <laughs> you know but now anyway it's it, there's some pretty good stories there including his uh uh his brother Fred, but let's let's go back uh, a little bit. So that was was that really the the, the the thing that really spurred you to become more active and do investigations? Oh yeah, yeah, the Linda's books. Yes, Linda's books. Because you could just track down every sighting and go to every area, um, and basically we did most of them over the last since 2011. I think we have visited almost every sighting of a dog man and most of the Bigfoot ones that are mentioned in her books. Wow. Uh, you know, we, uh, my wife and I did that too one time. We were on a road trip and we took one of Linda's books because uh, I'm proud to say we have our own Michigan dog man that pops up now and yes. then. And so we, we chronicled certain areas, not specific enough to where we could actually find out where it was seen. But uh, this thing is, it, you know, it's interesting. There's a, uh, there's a podcast called Dog Man Encounters Radio. And people, all kinds of people are coming out with their sightings. And many of them are go back 20 years or whatever. And, and I wonder, it's almost like as weird as it was to see a Bigfoot, people would be a little more comfortable with saying, you know, I saw this ape-like creature in the woods, but seeing an upright canid is just maybe too weird and people would just keep their mouth shut. Yes, and more scary too. Yes, yes. I think um, Bigfoot is just doesn't seem that shocking, but to know that there's an upright six or seven foot tall um, dog with tall ears on two legs is frightening. Well, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Linda Godfrey. For those who don't know about her, a, a good, tell us a little bit about her early journey in, into this and how she discovered it. Oh, I think she started, she was working for a newspaper in Elkhorn and um, just drawing cartoons. And then they started getting reports of uh, sightings of the upright dog man on, the, on Bray Road. And that was in the late 80s. And I think she started writing about it in the early 90s. Yes. And it just took off. 
because there were so many sightings and believable people that well, said she, that they've seen something. She went to the uh, local sheriff's office, I think, and he actually had a file that said yep. werewolf on it. Yeah, the DNR guy. <laughs> because yeah, the werewolf people, people would see these things. At first, they would think it was just some kind of a mangy dog, big dog on the side of the road, and then it would stand up on two legs. Oh. Yes. Yeah. They would love to tell you that it's just an oversized wolf or something, but um, too many people have seen it stand up. And well, walk and, on two legs. Yes. Uh, and, and there's... Uh, there, there are just so many, too many, like you say, witnesses and patterns. Um, she uh, uh, early in, in her in her book, I, I, I revisited her first book to prepare for my talk, and she talks about how many of the people that had a dogman experience also had many other uh, paranormal or psychic experiences. Would you say that's true about you? Oh gosh, yes. Absolutely. You can't believe the stuff that I've seen. I think once you look down that rabbit hole, if you spend enough time there, you are going to see things you can't even imagine. Well, let me just, before we, we ask you to give some of your experiences, I remember early in the Beast of Bray Road, she talks about a, a woman, uh, what is it? What was her name? Was it, it wasn't you, was it? Donna? Mm, to remember. Well, I that, can't re what was the story? Well, it, she was talking to the uh, animal control officer in Dresden, uh -huh. and uh, they were they were talking about the possibility of some cult related activity with the dog man. Then all of a sudden, a bunch of books flew out of the shelf, uh, oh, like wow. a poltergeist <laughs> phenomenon thing. Yeah. So, so there's just there's many indications that suggest, like so many other cryptids, I think that, that uh, in Drizzy. Uh, and okay, and yeah. uh, that that so many of them. Uh, seem to come with other events and john keel i've got to mention john keel he's mm -hmm. one of those that early on saw that uh you know people that were having these experiences had all kinds of paranormal experiences so tell us uh tell us about some of your experiences whether they're related to your your dog man investigations or or not well with the with the with all of it going on we've seen um i have pictures of bigfoot and one in a tree seems to be a younger one and then one in tall weeds and um but along with that then if you spend enough time out there um we we saw the night before um easter in 2012 we were sitting out by the uh we call it the bigfoot woods by lima marsh and we were going to get out of the car for the first time in the dark because we had been afraid you know, it took us a while to go into the woods, even during the daytime. And then once we were in the woods, we thought, well, now we have to come back at night and see what we can find. And we're sitting in the truck waiting for the rain to stop. And as soon as the rain is stopping, we heard um, the geese getting stirred up by the pond. And then it sounded like one was being carried across the back of the woods. And then it sounded like something killed it. And then pretty soon we saw huge orbs that had to be 20 foot in diameter in the woods and and floating through the woods and then a whole tree lit up um like it had a spotlight on it but was it was from the uh the ground up and then out of the corner of our eye we see something flying in that we thought was a maybe a helicopter because it was coming too close but yet we couldn't hear any motors or any any chopper blades or anything and we had the windows down and i said that's a plane that's going to crash and it didn't it floated in next to the bigfoot woods is which is what we call it and it hovered next to the woods not, let's see maybe about a half a football field away from jackie and i sitting in the truck and it was a huge ufo it was just a big white circle of light and we didn't have binoculars. I had a crummy little point and shoot camera. Um, cell phone phones were not what they are now. And we didn't want to get out of the truck because we didn't want the lights in the truck to come on because we were afraid that they would um, grab us and start probing us or something. That was our biggest fear. And so we sat in the truck with the lights out and stayed still. And we watched it for like 45 minutes and it turned from a, a big white um, 
you know, huge orb thing to um, a bell shape with different colored lights on it. And then it changed into like a cigarette type shape. And then it blinked out and it came back on. And after about 45 minutes, it floated back towards the marshes. And then it floated um, back towards some further marshes. And then we just lost sight of it, but it came back five more weeks in a row until we finally parked our behinds out by the woods in lawn chairs and waited for it. And because so, this time we were going to get pictures of it. And, you know, because we were brave now. Let's go, mm -hmm. let's go find this thing. And it didn't come close enough. It didn't even, it started out farther away. And so there was no getting pictures of it. They must know somehow that you're sitting there waiting for it. Because every time you get your camera out, you might as well forget about it because you're not going to get a picture. But also in those woods we saw, uh, I have a picture of a gremlin type being running through the woods. I just had a feeling. What, uh, just describe, describe more what that looked like. Well, it was black and white. It looked like it had an Indian headdress on. Um, its eyes were white. Um, its face was half white, half black. Um, it was running. You could see its knee bent and its its uh, elbows bent as though it was running through the woods. It couldn't have been more than maybe two foot high, three foot. And I didn't see it at the time, but I took a picture because I just had a feeling that I needed to. And when I uploaded it to my laptop, I said, there is a creature in this picture. And so then I just zoomed in on it and it's something, I don't know what it is, so I just call it a gremlin. I have no idea what it is. Do you think it, Steve, it, could be a puck wudgie? Well, I've thought about that and per perhaps also what they call the, the Cherokee little people. I yeah. don't know if the, if the, if the Cherokee uh, were in that part of Wisconsin or not, but there's quite a, uh, a belief in uh, many Native American tribes of these little people. And right. uh, it sounds, some of the uh, experiences sound very credible. Yeah, I, I mean, you couldn't, I couldn't see a, a face like they describe with those beings, but um, it was just a black, I could see eyes and a mouth and I think a nose, I can't remember, but it was just black and white. It, there was no um, flesh colored face. There were no other features other than it had this big headdress on and it, its whole body was black and white and it couldn't have been more than two or three foot tall. Um, but along with that in those woods, we also had, um, uh, a, well, we were trapped in the woods one day and we couldn't figure out how to get out of there. And um, which was really weird because the road was only maybe 10 feet away and we could see the cars going by. And yet, I think something had zapped us or something and and we couldn't find our way out and then it started getting dark and and then it was like we were released and we we started walking um, out of the woods into the cornfield and we heard one wolf howl with a laugh at the end of it and we took off running like you can't believe. oh, <laughs> oh my, my gosh. gosh to hear that big <clears throat> and to know that we were in those that small wooded area with whatever creature made that howl and that laugh at us. And, and I told Jackie, I said, shine the flashlight behind me. And she goes, why? And I go, because because if it's coming for us, I need to run faster. <laughs> but I mean, I'm, I'm 15 years older than her and she's six foot and I'm five foot four. And of course she's gonna make it to the truck before I am and I'm gonna get it. You're, you're her <laughs> insurance. Yes. <laughs> And so, but nothing came after us. I think they were just having fun with us. Oh my God. I don't know what well, it was. I, I think you did the right thing because in the movies, the script dictates that they turn around and follow the noise. And then uh, <laughs> yeah. later on, the hero of the movie uh, comes and checks their bodies, you know, because yeah. you're, 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 you're like, you know, Bruce Campbell when, early on in his pictures. Uh, he would, uh, he'd be in for the first few minutes and something would get him. He'd be in an elevator that snapped, or some mutant gorillas would get him in Africa. So yeah. you don't want to be you don't want to be Bruce Campbell in his earlier films. No, no. You think you can be brave, but you know, every once in a while, but because we had wandered those woods, we were in there for a couple of hours, two or three hours. 
and then we couldn't find our way out and which was bizarre and and then all of a sudden we can find our way out and they just had they just howled at us and started laughing and i don't know whether it was a dog man or a bigfoot i have no idea and, because and about oh go ahead oh i was going to say because then later um that year we saw weir boy which was like a shapeshifter and then um what okay, am I wait 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 stop yeah. tell, tell us more about the weir boy first don't, <laughs> oh, don't lose your thoughts but oh okay so um jackie and i were going to the bigfoot woods uh, we were in my truck and we were headed out and, and let me just stop you again about how far is this roughly from elkhorn or the bray road area oh that's a, it's about 20 minutes oh, okay yeah. So it's it's not it's just kind of in the same neck of the woods. And is that some place that uh, somebody like me could uh, venture onto some place without uh, violating private property rights? Yes, that's a place you can go. Yes, because, because you're you're. You're giving me encouragement, Donna, because I've yeah. always thought that I'm the guy that would show up with the paranormal crew that normally experiences thing. And I would be the guy that would be the dampener that would just ground <laughs> out all the paranormal activity. But you say you're the person that doesn't really experience it until you go there and you're, you're in that hot spot yourself. Oh, and it always something always happens every time we're out there. OK, every so I, I interrupted you. So let's talk about the weird boy and then the, what was to follow. So in the same area as um, the Bigfoot have been seen, and then we have the wolf howl at us, and then um, we're going out to look in the Bigfoot woods again. It's on a sunny Sunday afternoon, about one o'clock, and we're going down to Highway 59 towards Lima Marsh, and between Milton and Whitewater, and um, we see a, you know, a young guy just with his head down, walking along the shoulder of the road, but from a distance, we could see that his hair was shockingly matted on his head, and it was matted about four or five inches high, and it was matted in a ball at his neck, a big ball of hair, and it looked like he just climbed out from under a pile of leaves where he'd been living for the last 10 years, but his clothes were clean, and they were modern, except for his shoes, which were... Um, like Keds, you know, those slip on things. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody really wears anymore, but they were clean. His clothes were clean and, um, but his hair was dirty and matted. And when he looked up at us, we both screamed because he had a pronounced forehead. He had like dark circles under his eyes, but the most shocking part was his teeth were huge. They were, at least four times the size of my own. They were completely flat and straight. You could see all of his uppers and all of his lowers oh. because he had his mouth in this big grin, um, but his teeth were yellow and they were stained with green and brown. They were just horrid. And Jackie and I screamed. And so we, of course we decide we've got to come back around and get this guy on video. Um, so, <laughs> I'd, I'd be screaming too, just to let you know, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, because it was just when he looked up, you know, first you see his hair as you're coming down the highway and then he looks up and you see his face and his teeth. And then it's like, uh oh, I thought Skinwalker was my first thought. And so we come back around, we make a U-turn and come back around. And I don't want to pull up alongside him because I was afraid he would turn into a wolf and get in the back of the truck and scare us to death. Um, that was my thought. So we pulled into uh, near the cemetery and made it, you know, turned the truck around and got the cameras ready so that when he comes walking by us, which he would have to do as he continued on his way to Janesville um, or Milton, wherever he was going. And we got the video camera ready and um, the regular cameras ready. And we pulled up closer to the road. Um, to catch him as he went by and then as soon as he was going by we were going to pull up even closer and all of a sudden a white van going the opposite direction he was going like we were um, in a white unmarked van completely brand new no markings on it whatsoever two guys in it in short sleeve shirts um, they make a u-turn and pull up next to him and Jackie says they're going to pick him up and I said they're not going to pick him up who would pick him up and they sure as heck did pick him up. 
we couldn't see or video anything because there were two big trees in the cemetery that were in our way. Um, and I don't know whether they threw him in the van or he got in on his own, but he got in the back seat and then they made a U-turn and took off. So we were going to follow him going. I was doing 70 miles an hour trying to catch up to them. And we never saw them again in spite of looking down every side road and every driveway between Milton and Whitewater, and we never saw it again. That's one of the most bizarre encounters I've ever heard. Is totally there any bizarre. Chance, any, any chance that this could be some kid in a horrific costume? N no, the teeth, were, no, and the hair. And you know what? After that, about two weeks after that, I was, my husband and I were coming home down um, the road right it's a country road by our house. And just before we come into Milton, which has a population of about 6,000, just as we were about to enter town, there's a cornfield on the right. And um, up from the cornfield and the ditch looks like there's coming a, a deer. And so we slowed down because my husband thought, you know, I don't want to hit the deer um, and have an accident. So we slowed down and then we had to actually come to a complete stop because it was a wolf, it was a brown timber wolf, that's what it looked like, that walked right out in front of us and sauntered across the road, looking around like, I know you and you know me, and I think it was just letting me know, I know where you live, because we don't have wolves this far south. I mean, there could be the occasional wolf, but it was, what a coincidence that this wolf just walked right out in front of my husband's, you know, our car and stopped us cold on the highway. Did you think the wolf could have been the person that you saw shape-shifted? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was my first thought. I thought, if that thing looks at me, I'm going to die. And, well, you know, I'll just die of a heart attack. And um, it never looked me in the eyes. It just looked around and sauntered across the highway. Mm -hmm. Just like, I know where you live, don't think I don't. That's the impression I got. I think that they all, if if they know you're looking for them, I think they all just start to fool with you. You know, it's like Skinwalker Ranch where, you know, a lot of those people that did the investigations think that those some of those things went home with them. Well, and there's also the, that, uh, the trickster aspect that seems to follow uh, mm -hmm. investigators in this. It, there's something very disconcerting uh, to me about uh, I mean I can handle uh, strange looking cryptids even some of these one off cryptids we hear about but right. when they start sporting clothes and even you know uh, 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 shoes even though they might be out of style uh, there, right. there are there are some Bigfoot reports occasionally where they see them wearing kind of a ripped shirt or something like that mm -hmm. and that's that, that that kind of thing just throws me for a loop but uh, people should I think people should realize that if uh, if you were spinning tails here the, the last thing you would do is talk about this creature wearing clothes. You know, no, nobody does that. It's just making up something. <laughs> right. And if he was so, if his hair was so matted and dirty and his teeth were so green and brown and yellow, how did he have perfectly clean clothes on and brand new clean shoes on? The rubber on the, the white rubber on the shoes was spotless. I noticed that right away. Plus, mm -hmm. he had a plaid shirt on. Oh, <laughs> the plaid that's shirt. a sign of evil, definitely. <laughs> well, my girlfriend, but, another so, friend that I know, um, her neighbor's son had a sighting of a werewolf, an actual werewolf on two legs, came right in that same area about one minute down the road, um, saw a werewolf run through her yard and out into the cornfield um, on Halloween night. And he went into the house, he was crying, he was so scared, and he was a teenager. But it was a full-on werewolf, it was, um, or a dog man. It was up on two legs, and it was about six foot tall, and it ran right past him. And he just stood there and watched it and was scared to death. So in the same area, and then the flying man bat's been seen there too. Oh, Okay, let's, let's. I'm going to ask you about that in just a minute, and I'm going to give uh, Brandon, Andy. <laughs> I haven't given them any time to ask any questions yet, but <laughs> let me let me do a brief intermission. But before I do that, I've got to say, Donna, you realize that when you saw this this 
this wereboy or whatever it was that you took temporary refuge at a cemetery. Yeah. <laughs> That's no. what they do in movies, and then they don't—they're not—they're not counting on the zombies, you know. Oh God, I—I I didn't even think of that. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, you are listening to the High Strangeness Factor, copyrighted on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Today, Andy, Brandy, and I are talking to Donna Wells Fink about some of her lifetime experiences, and we will be talking more about her adventure in and around Bray Road. Uh, so, uh, Brandy, Andy, uh, just uh, let loose for a while if you have some questions. I got a couple for you. Go for it. You go first, then. Um. The two guys, the the two guys that came with the van. Yeah. What did what did you think of them? I'm thinking of even though they were in a white van, you know, what were they wearing? Because I'm thinking, is this a man in black type, you know, trying to obscure what's happening here? Just well, what was got, your impression? I got the impression that that's what they were, although they were wearing short sleeve plaid shirts. Um, plaid again. You know, just cotton, though. I mean, Weir Boy had on uh, a flannel plaid shirt. Okay. But the two guys that um, picked him up had on short sleeve um, plaid cotton shirts, um, kind of like dress pants. And um, they weren't, they didn't really stand out any in particular. It, you know, you would think that if he was escaped from a home or something, um, uh you know, they might have some designation on the van or we would be able to follow them into Whitewater, which was the way they were headed and catch up to them going 70 miles an hour. I pulled out right behind him um, and he lost me. Wow. Did they, did they have a license plate of any description on the yeah. van? Yeah, they did. But I didn't get okay. it because they were gone before I could even get to the end of the road. It's I mean, easy for people to say all the all the time. How come nobody got a picture? How come you didn't notice this or that? But when you're in the middle of it, you you know you just aren't thinking about those things. I'm sure. Yep. Yeah, because all we were thinking about was they're going to pick him up. No, they're not going to pick him up. And and so, you know, then when they pulled over, we were just astounded. It's like they mm-hmm. picked him up and threw him in there, made a U-turn, and took off. And we thought, well, we're going to catch up with them and find out if they're taking him to a home or if they're taking him, you know, to a mental facility or what's going on. But he, he com- they completely disappeared so quickly that it had to be something other than just a human being. Had to be. So one other question then. All the three people, the wereboy the, and the two van people, uh-huh. they all, I'm getting idea that you felt they were all physical entities they look like it yeah okay and what about the the gremlin that you saw did you think that like did you think that was physical or was it more transparent because it wasn't flesh colored or what was your impression of that no it was physical i mean you couldn't see through it um and yet it was some kind of paranormal entity i don't know i've you know, I've read so many, so many books and so many stories and, and listened to so many podcasts and I've never really heard of anyone um, describing anything exactly like this was. I mean, I can send you the picture and you can post it. I mean, if oh, that'd like. be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll see. do that. And, um, you know, I, I've never seen anything like it or heard of anything like it, but except for those small Indians like you talk about. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing that compares to it at all. But it was definitely something solid. Okay. Well, at least in the picture it was. Now, when I was looking there, I didn't see anything at all. Okay. okay. Go ahead, Andy. 
Um, my, actually, you kind of covered one of my questions with the idea perhaps it was some kind of psychiatric patient who'd escaped and was then picked up again. But from what you're saying about, one, how they appeared, and two, how you, they seem to completely lose you so quickly and easily suggest it probably wasn't something along those lines. Um, it's just I find it fascinating, this whole thing of so many different kinds of forms of strangeness being seen in the same sort of wooded area. It's, you know, none of these things kind of fit any single simple category. I mean, you could argue that perhaps a dog man is just another the form of, of a Bigfoot. It's, it's just a large humanoid hairy creature. But there's for me the same there's definite differences in terms of physical appearance and movement. So but it, I'm just struck again that you got the idea of this small goblin type creature. I'm currently doing some research in a book I'm working on at the moment, which is um, a collection of first hand experiences from the Victorian age over here. I have a very large collection of folklore um, compilation books published mainly in the Victorian times, the 1800s. And while going through them for a different book I've had published a couple of years ago, I came across lots of weird and strange descriptions of entities and things people have encountered. And some of the things you're talking about fit with some of the things I've read about, particularly the light. There's something that Stephen and I have talked about a few times that the idea of the white light or yellowy white light is almost like the purest form of the weirdness. And then it becomes something else afterwards. How often even the Victorian reports I've been reading, there was one I mean, just last night of uh, basically a blacksmith who observed this strange light from the distance that gradually moved closer and closer to his workshop and then just shot straight up in the air. And within a few minutes, apparently a member of his family had died. And it was like, well, that's interesting, the timing there. But the description was basically of a white light that was moving across the, the moors towards him. It was up in Scotland. But it's that collection of almost very different kinds of descriptions of weirdness occurring in very similar places at the same kind of time. I find that fascinating. It's all that none of it kind of fits with any real classic description of anything in particular. And the other thing that struck me was there's a wood over here that's become very well known for a particular, supposed UFO landing in the 1980s and Rendlesham Forest. That oh, yeah. people don't realise that Rendlesham has been the site of dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of strange sightings long before any UFO occurrence that happened in 1980. It goes back to the, again, the 1800s. The Rendlesham has got a reputation of having lots of weird things happening in it long before any UFO supposedly landed there. Now, there's a lot of debate and controversy around the Rendlesham Forest UFO landings, whether they actually happened or not, but there's no doubt there is strange, high strangeness, shall we say, in that wood. And that's some, I've been there a few times and it's got a vibe to it, especially as it gets dark. It does feel a little strange. So that, as I found, is an interesting parallel. These areas, the points of high strangeness, were when lots of different strange things seem to happen in a relatively small area and they're very different to each other, the things that occur. So I found that really quite fascinating. It's well, that's um, what there's a portal. Yes, but that's what's happening on Lee Hample's property, too. And right. we need to talk a little bit more about the possible why of it. But uh, Donna, let's switch. I know you've got a lot more to say, which means we'll probably have to have you back sometime. But, <laughs> but let's talk. A little, let's talk a little bit about uh, how did you meet Lee Hample? Um, I think that. I got to know him the best when um, I asked him to be a speaker at the conference. Oh, uh, okay. I had I had known of him and I had followed him and you know uh, on Facebook and um, any programs that he was on. I I always um, watched everything and followed him. And then I think when I contacted him about being a speaker, um, I had no idea the amount of trail cam photos and evidence that he has i had no idea well because, brandy and i didn't either and it was was overwhelming but go ahead well right because when you see him on television programs they never ever show any of those pictures or any of the video he has or anything other than the footprints and then they come to the conclusion that it's an oversized wolf which is totally ridiculous um and so, you know, until I saw the pictures, you know, I went to talk to him and, you know, he said he would show his pictures and everything. And I said, well, can we see him and, and we share him with us? And he was happy to do so. And we sat there with our mouths open for three hours the first time. Well, I, let's let's talk a little bit about that, and uh, we're going to try to paint these word pictures for Andy <laughs> because mm -hmm. it's pretty overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, of course, we, I gave the history a bit. It was I think he was there from what about 
2010, 2011 or something like that. He farms the property uh, and he started, they, they told him, they said, you know, there's a werewolf on your property. And he's right. thinking, yeah, okay, well, you're in the hooch again, right? So, uh, but then he started seeing it and he started to put up these cameras and he started to get these incredible pictures. And uh, it, like I said, he was, was uh, just just briefly before he would have t- told Linda that this stuff's crazy. But uh, uh, Andy, I got to tell you, the, one of the guys that that spoke there. And by the way, I, I have to have to say this: the Bucks County Paranormal guys, Bucks County Paranormal Investigations, Eric yes. Mintel and Dominic Satel, they yes. their their video is up now of their reveal. Uh, they tormented. Brandy and I, when they were on before, because they wouldn't reveal their secrets until <laughs> Halloween. Yes, yes. They, yeah. they, they, it was like holding that carrot out and saying, oh, here's, he, here's the carrot. Oh, no, you can't have it. So, <laughs> <Me too. laughs> really good guys. Yeah. And yeah. they're going to be on again. But uh, yeah, uh, they, now, now you were also you were in their video. You're, you're there because they interviewed you about the uh, about the beast. What what was that conversation like? Well, we were. They're a great group, um, totally awesome people, and and, and, they, and they they came from uh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. And they flew in, and let me let me just interrupt you for a second. Uh, while uh, actually Brandy and I were drove down the first time we met them, but we were innocently strolling by on Bray Road one day, and they were out there with their uh, their drone, which they were having some electrical problems with at first, but then well, and they that and that's when they told us they were getting good stuff, and I guess they spent uh, the night vigil out at Lee's property. Have you been stayed, stayed overnight at Lee's property? Yeah, we stayed there until about two in the morning because it just rained the entire night uh, there and it was cold and, you know, nobody wanted to stand outside of the vehicle for, you know, hours on end, although we did right. get out a few times. But, yeah, we, we had our own experiences while we were there. It was I, I think I think. I would love to do that. I, I say that now in the yes. safety of my room, talking to a computer. But uh, you know, I, sorry, I can be very brave when I'm on Skype. Let me tell you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, so, uh, well, let's. Uh, okay. Well, let's. Uh, Brandy. Yeah. Let, let's 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 uh, let's ask you. When uh, we we went, uh, what what they did was Donna had it set up so that uh, Lee did not want to just speak there. So we went to the the farm. And in the barn, he had it set up so we could see all these images. And we took a, a brief little hayride around the area. Mm-hmm. But uh, Brandy, tell us about your impressions when you started seeing these images. It, I thought we were going to see, you know, the same stuff that ev- everybody shows on their TV show where they think they might have something and, oh, it's a squirrel or something, you know. So huh. I I wasn't quite sure what we were going to see, but it like Donna said, he had so many photos and he didn't even show us all of them, but it was hours worth that he went through and they were, they were very well taken um, with, um, you know, you could tell the size of things you could, you know, he knew exactly where it was taken. Um, Some of the trail cams he baited. um, So he knew you know, that what was around that area and they were, I mean, I don't think it's too much to say they were mind blowing. There, there were things on there that you never thought you would actually see. Uh, the good news is that now uh, Lee has not, has been kept, has been keeping most of these pictures very close to his vest, but on the Bucks County paranormal reveal their investigation there are several. You see several images of, uh, yes. of some of these strange things. Uh, let's let's go around here. Uh, Donna, uh, tell us about some of the images and your reactions to them. Then I want to go to Brandy about, about some of the specific images. But go ahead, Donna. Well, what shocked me was that I always thought that these things avoided cameras because that's what you always hear. And how many pictures do we have? Hardly any. So I was shocked to see he must have how many thousand? I, and I don't so, know, but he, he didn't get many of the what might be the creature, but he got these incredible UFO kind of pictures and some things that just don't make any sense. But I, I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, he didn't show you all the pictures. Of no, I know. The dog man that he has. And, 
you, you can actually see it's standing up close to now the, the camera is what five or six foot off the ground. And so you can see the creature standing. You can only see half the creature. Only half is in frame and you can see it's black and you can see the outline. You can see the the tall ear. You can see that um, that split in the ear in one of the pictures where, you know, like some dogs have, but mm -hmm. cats, all cats have. Um, you can see that. You can see the fur on the arms. Um, you could. He's also got uh, pictures of it farther out in the field because um, he he was out there during the daylight, and there it was in the field that that butts up to Bray Road. And first it's on four leg or two legs, then it's on four, then it's on two, um, and then it just walks off into the woods and. The different UFOs he has pictures of, and um, the orbs and the lights, and um, I I can't even remember what all he has. Just amazing array and of. He's got, and they've all got the timestamp. So sometimes when you see the what must be some kind of a metallic craft, it whips around a tree. This thing that looks like a turtle yes. shell, and yeah. in a very short period of time. Uh, but. Uh, and the, 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 the dog man pictures you were talking about, there's the, uh, you get like part of a silhouette, but it's dark, where right. it was almost like, but but you, these other ones where the bait is out there and the bait is taken, mm -hmm. uh, the where you should have gotten clearer pictures of these things. It's like there's some, it's it's hard to, to wrap your head around. These things act like animals. They eat roadkill. They eat bait. That has been left behind or at least they take it yet there's some kind of an intelligence that prevents us from getting them clear photographs head on for the most part the ones you talked about uh, that you see it standing up in the field and getting it on all fours were quite a distance and he said he yeah. had it you can't really see any detail but he said he had it analyzed and this one uh, I, I don't know who does all his uh, the analysis but uh, he said one of them said clearly that this whatever it is is six feet tall Right. And uh, let, let's, uh, Brandy, I want you to talk a little bit about some of the images and, and uh, uh, what you're, you know, some, some of the specific ones that stood out to you. Sure. First of all, I, I want to add, um, we talked about last, um, on one of the other episodes, um, that these cameras were set to take photos um, based on heat and motion. Yeah, good point. So even if it was dark out, and it, you know, it, you didn't notice there was something walking by the camera. The heat signature should have should have shown that something was there removing the carcass that he had put out there. Um, but the ones that stood out for me were the footprints yes. um, where there would be fresh snow and all of a sudden in the middle of the field, the footprints start there's no footprints leading up to them um they just start right out in the middle of the field and then they are walking toward the wood line um as if the animal only had two feet there there are two tracks walking two foot the tracks of two feet i guess walking toward the wood line and then all of a sudden the tracks split into two different animals going in opposite directions and then just end in the snow. Um, I, I just, I cannot figure out how that happened if it's not something paranormal. I just I, I, right. can't see how something physical could make those tracks. And the description of the tracks, the DNR people, was one lady that told him that he had to be a liar in faking these things. He's finding the tracks in the dirt and in the snow, and they're five-toed. They have the pad and then the heel. And uh, right. you remember what, what, what his brother Fred said originally when he said that he found these tracks that just started in the middle of nowhere? He said, said it must, must, have, must have parachuted in. Right, right. <laughs> well, and then he had um, a couple photos of several black somethings, we couldn't really tell what, small, that seemed to be coming down out of the clouds. Like one minute they were there, the next minute, or, you know, they weren't there, excuse me, and the next minute they were, and then they were lower, and... They were like pods. Yes, it was almost like, because the, um, the, 
the way the pixels were when he tried to get a clearer image of them, it seemed like they were something solid surrounded by something that was either translucent or transparent um, because it seemed like there was maybe a circular or amorphous type shape around a solid object that was falling out of the sky that you couldn't decipher what it was. It, there was one image where if you look at it, I, it looks like a, not a snake exactly, but like a black rope or something that goes yes. up into two humps. It's suspended in the air. And he, he mentioned about how that looks pretty weird, right? And then he pans over to the right and you see some kind of a boxy machine like thing. I don't know if it's on the ground or in the air. It looks like it might have a couple wheels or discs on it. And uh, and 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 also what about the uh, night uh, 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 you get these weird light anomalies. It's like a beam that comes down, but then diffracts in the middle of nowhere with nothing to diffract. Right. Uh, and then, you know, it's just. Uh, and that I reminded mean, me of the Skinwalker, the experiments that they were doing at the Skinwalker with where the lights were, they, mm. the lights would flash out of nowhere. You know, they'd see a light and flashing and there was nowhere that it was coming from. They're, they couldn't yeah. decide where it was coming from. That's kind of what that, that. Yeah, that's, that might, I thought that as well, reminded. same as you, yeah. Yeah. Some kind of thing. And did you see the, the UFO that was shaped like uh, Jeff Bezos um, uh, rocket ship? Oh, I don't know if I remember I that. don't recall seeing that one, no. Maybe he didn't show it to you. May, because <laughs> I think during the later show, I told him, I said, come on, Lee, we got to see that one. And because it's shaped, you know what Jeff Bezos right. uh, rocket ship is shaped mm -hmm. like. Um, yes. And this one was shaped the exact same way. Huh. It, it's just fascinating. The different uh, the different UFOs that you see in his pictures, they're all different. But, but what floors me is these uh, carcasses disappearing. Some of them have been there for a while and are decaying. And then all of a sudden, you can see the timestamp. I can't remember exactly how long it, the, the space was, but they're gone. And there was nothing uh, that would trigger the camera. There, the cameras weren't triggered. And you look, and there's no footprints, and, uh, and there's no drag marks. Also, you know, he was getting these photographs of this mist. There's a photograph of Lee, uh, the, the, the camera triggered a photograph of him. And one of those mists is kind of surrounding him. But he didn't see it visually. Now, now that would, after reading uh, several missing 411 books, I think yes. I'd stay the hell away from those mists. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he had no idea that the mist was, and and it actually, because he, he remained in front of the trail cam with what he was looking at, and I'm not sure if this is when the camera was set at eight second intervals or 30 second intervals, but in any case, the mist just got thicker and thicker around him to where he was basically obscured by the mist, but he, he said he had no idea there was any mist there. He didn't see any. That's really strange. It was bizarre. And it so, almost looks like there, there's something materializing and dematerializing some being um, in some of his pictures. Where right. It, you know, the black cloud forms yes. almost looks like something's appearing. And then sometimes it looks like it's disappearing. So what have you experienced? Uh, I, I know that you had bad weather, but you still did experience some things, did you not? Or maybe not that time, but another time? Yeah, we were when we were out there, um, Jackie and I had gotten out of the vehicle and um, which I triggered one of Lee's trail cams. And it looks to me in one of the pictures, like there's um, a hand around my arm with like a lightsaber coming out of it. Um, I did, And then in the next picture, you can see that there's nothing behind me and it's not the hood on my coat, or you can see that there's, you know, Jackie's six foot tall. So if she was behind me, you could have seen her. Um, and in the next, the very next picture, there's nothing there. And then um, at one point, um, well, of course, my flare didn't work. 
Mm -hmm. first thing. And then the next thing is, is Lee's uh, night vision wouldn't work either. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, his trail cam did. And so he got that picture of me. And I'm not sure what that was, but it looks to me like there's a hand around my shoulder. Um, uh -huh. With well, the lightsaber coming out of it is the only way I can describe it. And then when we were sitting in the vehicle, it was about two in the morning and we were up by the barn and just waiting for something to happen or to see anything. And um, my girlfriend, Diane, saw something about seven foot tall and dark, just a dark shadow being walk behind the vehicle and move off towards the barn and it was gone. Oh, and, gosh. Yeah. Well, and then the guys from Bucks County um, got the howls on um, yes. video, and then they had eye shine. I saw that eye shine, and I thought, oh, my God. Yeah, that was that was how, pretty noticeable. Mm -hmm. how, how high off the ground was the eye shine, do you think? Well, it was tall. Okay. It was tall. And, and, you know, you didn't see it? Oh, my gosh. Um I saw it right away and I thought these guys don't even know that eye shine is over there. And then they spotted it. Right. I thought it was about seven foot tall, wasn't it? I wasn't even sure if it was up in a tree or if that or if the ground sloped up where where it was where they saw it. You know, if if there was a small like ditch and then the ground sloped up. You could it was dark, so not knowing that area, it's hard to well, I know that area, and mm -hmm. I've been off in there, and there is no ditches there. Okay. Not in that area. Mm -hmm. And so um, I tend to think it was something tall. I don't well, know what, but you can't tell, but you can certainly see the eye shine. Yes. I remember the one picture that he had with the, the beast sitting on its haunches and with those great big glowing white eyes? Yes. You saw that one. Right. Well, the eyes reminded me of that picture, uh, the glowing eyes in, in the Bucks County video. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that was really interesting, and they got some really good howls a couple of times. So we're definitely not talking about a, a marsupial on stilts. No. Uh, no. But, uh, I, sorry, that's a bad <laughs> pun. Uh, that, that's that's my worst pun tonight. But, you know, they I had a, uh, they, their, next, their next investigation was in the Pine Barrens. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, uh, uh, Eric sent me a couple howls they got from that. But he also messaged me. He said that some of the stuff that they have encountered there seemed to parallel some of the stuff they found at Bray Road. So that's going to be another great reveal uh, coming up. But, uh, okay, let's. Uh, Let me let's ask Donna a quick, quick yeah. question. Oh, please, go ahead. When you, when you had the picture of the hand, potentially the arm or what have you on your on your arm do you remember whether or not you f thought you felt somebody touching you when no. that happened no mm -mm. not at all okay. i had no idea that any of that was going on and mm -hmm. i can send you that picture too i mean it's open for interpretation but there's something white wrapped around my arm Mm. And looks to be like there's a few fingers there, and then there's a light coming out of that. Those that hand was what it oh. looks like to me. I I don't know. That's the interpretation I get. Okay, I'll I'll send you that picture, and you can post it if you want. There's an interesting encounter that uh, Linda talks about in the uh, Monsters Among Us, and uh, somebody named Mike Moran was driving through Pennsylvania on Route 81. 1994 and he sees this 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 orb or this light well at first he thinks it's a light on perhaps an atv driving kind of recklessly through the woods at night he's thinking this guy must be crazy that's got to be dangerous and he sees how this is going to intercept the road that he's on and when this would get to the uh, edge of the road there's kind of a cliff that goes down so it could be very dangerous but as he watches the light morphs into a six-foot dog man and he drew a picture of it for Linda, but uh, you, you know he was just flabbergasted. And you, you wonder, uh, is that what's happening on Bray Road? If we could actually be there to see it, if a, mm -hmm. if a camera could catch it, is it is one of these orbs moving along in the snow, and then this thing passes through a portal or manifests, and all of a sudden we get the footprints? That's the impression mm. I get. Mm. It would make uh, sense. 
in a very strange world. But that would make sense, wouldn't it? As there is some kind of gap opening up and this, something's passing through the gap, as it were, and then sort of physically in our realm. But again, we're back to those light things. You know, really, that's the thing I always find most fascinating is things so often start with a light anomaly and then becoming something else. Uh, excellent. And you well, saw the, the video of the orb moving around his truck, right? And passing uh, between the truck and um, I'd like to see. his friend? I no. I saw that one. No. We didn't see that. Oh, Lee has a video of an orb moving around um, his pickup truck as he's sitting in it. But he said before that um, orbs have actually entered the vehicle and just oh my God. Put across the by the dashboard and then just gone out. So here we have the, these, uh, some kind of a an animal that acts like an animal. I mean, it uh, again, it, it it eats roadkill. It uh, it howls. Uh, yet it seems to be able to uh, more than just avoid a camera. It's right there in front of the camera, apparently, but the camera isn't triggering when it's there most of the time. But then you also get something that hints at some kind of technology, these strange looking craft, very solid looking metallic uh, pieces of some kind of hardware. What the hell is going on? Is this, it, 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 I wonder if it's not, if, if this is actually some kind of a portal where the so-called the air is thin, is it all one thing coming from one source or is this sort of a grand central station where all these different things are happening and perhaps they're not even necessarily connected with each other, but then how is it that what we think of as dumb brutes and perhaps they're not dumb brutes at all, how is it that they avoid the cameras? Yeah, it's like we've talked about this sort of thing before, haven't we, Steve? The idea that it's somehow more comfortable to think of them purely as cryptid animals that are in this world. We just haven't caught or spotted them anymore. The idea that there's something more to them than that, that there is an intelligence of a very different kind to ours. So it doesn't seem to make sense to us that a intelligent creature would just pick up and eat roadkill, but yet be able to mass appear beside it to pick it up and then disappear with it it's like the juxtaposition of those two ideas something kind of very base and sort of at bestial the idea of eating roadkill but then this seeming high technology at the same time it doesn't make logical sense to us but then that's because that's how we think and these whatever they are may have a completely different system of logic that to them makes perfect sense so that's why i find the most fascinating the whole notion of the total strangeness of his all I've given the analogy many times of uh, we have uh, a thousand piece puzzle that if we could put it all together, we'd say, oh, that's what's happening. Yes. But we've only we've only got a dozen pieces of that puzzle and they're spread throughout. None of them are right next to each other. So we've got yeah. these little fragments of what the I mean, there's got to be some kind of objective reality to this. There's got to be some kind of principles involved. But I'm just at a loss to understand it. I mean, that comes back to what we have said before. It is perhaps that's the whole point. This isn't objective reality in the same sense that we, us, all four of us now are experiencing as a physical world around us. Perhaps this is the, the next level above that, if you like, that it's not fully physical in the physical world, but it's manifests in such a way as it leaves impressions, as we said before, John Keel said about that kind of thing, that these things become so real in a sense they create a physical impression that they don't actually exist. They're kind of winking out of existence, if you like. That kind of, it's just a little bit above our more base level of reality, if you like. They're less physically real than us, but still interact with the physical world around them. I find that idea kind of works for me. Donna, do you know if this is a, if there are actual ancient mounds right in this general area of Bray Road? You know, I, I'm not sure, but I, they're all over um, in our area, so I would bet. And so many of them have been plowed up and just built yeah. over. And, you know, Lee even said that um, uh, the neighbor across the road from him uh, years ago um a couple of the neighbors saw a huge UFO land in that cornfield across the road from from Lee's property. So this has been going on for a long time. This was when some older person was like 10 years old, so probably 60 years ago or so. Um, I can't really remember, but a, a huge UFO landed there. And all the neighbors in his area have seen something. They just won't talk about it at all. Right, they, right. I know. Uh they believe really clam up, don't they? 
Yes, yeah, and they, they've even heard and seen a hyena-type being running oh, that's, around. Oh, that's right. Lee said that there was more than one type of cryptid that mm -hmm. he has seen on that property. Right, and I wouldn't doubt if there's Bigfoot there, too. One of the pictures of a creature standing close up to the camera looked to Jackie and I and Diane like uh, a Bigfoot. Lee thinks it's a dog man, but I just see a round head. I don't see the ear. Um, I could be looking at it different than he does, but it almost looks like there's a Bigfoot standing up by the camera, too. Well, in Linda Godfrey's second book, Hunting the American Werewolf, uh, she talks about how through happenstance, she was looking at a, a cluster map of dog man sightings in, in an area of southern Wisconsin. And she was also looking at a map uh, of, uh, it was called Indian Mounds, I forget the name of the author, right, but right. The, the clusters lined up almost perfectly to, and, and these effigy mounds, but they were certain types of effigy mounds. They were the panther mounds and the water spirit mounds, more, almost exclusively. And I thought, you know, that seemed to be a little bit more than a coincidence. Mm. Oh, I agree. I think so, too. And that would that would also. Well, you know, I don't know. I, I, I wonder why I even try to figure these things out. It just gives me a, <laughs> gives me a headache. But it, it's just it's just fascinating uh, that all these things. And then, you know, I, I'm sorry to, to rip on the, the flesh and blood believers. But, you know, some of these people that believe that Dogman is merely an unknown creature. Uh, if they could just spend an hour or two with Lee Hampel, it would completely <laughs> destroy their paradigm. Oh, they people would just freak out if they saw what he has. That's why it was so good to have him, you know, do the presentation after the conference. And I hope he's going to do one next year because I see that he has more footage now of other strange things. So he's gathering stuff as we speak. Well, you know, Donna, if you ever need another, I'm just putting this out there. If you ever need another <laughs> researcher, now I, I had two two reasons people should take me along, but one you've destroyed because I was going to say that I could be the control group of one, the guy that nothing ever happens to to see if something <laughs> happens. But you, but you have you have fulfilled that already, so you blasted that. But uh, but like you know, you said you moved a little slower than your friend. Well. I'm not moving that fast these days. So I could be the guy that, you know, during danger, you could be like six or seven furlongs ahead of me by the time <laughs> I even knew something was wrong. So I just have to beat you. Is that it? <laughs> that, right. That's it. And it shouldn't be that hard. I'm a little bit <laughs> confused these days. So, yeah, you know, so I'm just, just putting that out there for, uh, you know, for safety's sake. Oh, but yeah. uh, No, I'd love to have you come out anytime. Well, I can. I, I there's a uh, there's a motel uh, not too far away that uh, I could stay at, and uh, I don't want to speak for Brandy, but I know Brandy is dying to go to one of these places sometimes, right, Brandy? Oh, well, she right? moves. Yes. She she moves pretty fast though, so she <laughs> wouldn't be that much help. But but in all seriousness, I would uh, I would love to spend a night vigil in some of these places uh, and to see what would happen. We could spend the night at Lee's if he'd let us. Well, that would be, I would love to. Uh, although, let me tell you something else. He said there was they they spent a night vigil out there. It was Lee. I think he said his godson. I think Fred was there and another relative, and they were they had a fire, and you know how gentlemen will have to wander off to and when nature yes. taps them on the shoulder, right? Well, they <laughs> would they would they would do that. But he said as the night went on, and they would hear you know, howls and, and some strange things are going on. That circle got a lot smaller. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and uh, and on, on a serious note, he said very seriously, he said, this is a different place at night. Oh, and yeah. uh, that would uh, and you've been there yourself to see it. Oh, yeah. But he's even he even has seen it in the daylight. I mean, yes. and, and then the hyena one time started towards them as they were standing there watching it oh. so they they got the on the atvs and got the heck out of there he said <laughs> can you yeah that something that i don't think we brought up um just in talking about bigfoot and the dog man is that um for people that don't aren't familiar with the dog man like they are with bigfoot is that a lot of or most of the reports of the dog man have some kind of like menacing overtones yes. like where with bigfoot they're 
more benign a lot of times the reports but the dogmen almost always seem to have some kind of like just i don't want to say evil intent but just more like a menacing overtone to them do you think that's the case oh, i agree i agree i think the dogman is a lot scarier and when we saw the the weird boy it it seemed sinister okay although, although he seemed like he was pulling a prank on us and my thoughts were you know i know you and you know me and he was out to scare us but i don't think he anticipated that we would make a u-turn and come back around to try and get video of him that's right that only happens in the movies yeah Right. <laughs> they've got to follow the script. I mean, that's they can't do anything else. <laughs> uh, um, let's see. I guess I guess we should probably start to wind things down. We've been uh, almost an hour and a half. Uh, but before we go, if if anybody, Donna, if you'd like to uh, talk about any more experiences and uh, Brandy and Andy, if you have any other questions or thoughts, please go ahead. I have a brief observation. Yes. I think it's very unfair you guys discussing going out together on the vigil and I'm over here 5,000 miles away. <laughs> <laughs> I can't join you. <laughs> but the most fascinating sighting was in Rendlesham Forest. I've listened to Jim Penniston at a Rockford MUFON meeting a couple of times and interviewed him one-on-one. Uh, -on -one, and his story, his newest book, Rendlesham Enigma, uh, yeah. timeline of what happened, um, is comes to the conclusion um, finally that it's uh, it's us from the future that are visiting um, the the earth and trying to find a way to save humanity. Um, that's what he discovered in when he touched the UFO. That's an yeah. interesting possibility. Very I mean, interesting. There are so many different theories and arguments and ideas around what happened in the forest that night. And I think the only thing that could be agreed upon almost universally is something happened in that forest that night but what it was it's a total mystery that was just one event of a whole series of strange occurrences and there are we're talking about burial grounds tumuli as we call them over here there are quite a number of those in and quite close to um Brenisham itself indeed in fact there was a report back in the 1960s of a farmer who basically had been mowing farming his own land which included the tumuli which had gradually been worn down over the years because of continued farming found within it a human skull that was elongated now how that got there and what it was doing there is an absolute mystery apparently he contacted the local police who probably came and collected it for analysis and that was the last anyone ever saw of it but this is the 1960s so hmm. you're 20 years before any ufo supposedly landed in the in the woods there i mean um there's a chap i know i've got to a little bit of, i've spoken to him occasionally who has catalogued all the strange sightings that have occurred in the woods i mean we're talking very bizarre things like creatures walking that are two-dimensional literally they're flat as they will cross the road he said and in the middle of the road it turned 90 degrees and was like a, a line just a <laughs> flat line and then turned again and was then flat but side on so you could see it so more than one person saw this thing literally walking across the road and it was like it was two-dimensional <laughs> that's just bizarre so you know that it is a very strange place certainly wow and, and you know that same decade of the 60s is when uh the great hammer film Quatermass in the pit came out in mm. which they find uh with many other things going on they find those elongated skulls buried deep under the subway if you remember yes. that three-legged grasshoppers and, that's one of my and, favorite films <laughs> and, and uh, yes it is it's superb it's it, it's it kind of uh it almost foreshadows some of the stuff that we look at but yeah. uh but Brandy has uh, done research into the uh, the elongated skull thing. And Brandy, isn't it true that some of these, uh, obviously some of these were manipulated by by people when they were children as they're growing up. But isn't it true that some of them don't bear those those earmarks or whatever you want to call them? Correct. Yes. They're, they're, they're they not just, anomalous. Right, they are. They are anomalous. And and even some of the ones that they found in Peru um, have um, ties with European um, ancestry. So, yeah. you know, maybe that's something that's 
you know, somehow connected to this Rendlesham find. Yeah, that, that is particularly interesting. Very interesting. To, to say, because that's the thing, because these things are known about mainly in sort of South America. What on earth were we doing over in the uh, uh, well, Suffolk um, countryside in the 1960s? Right. It's an absolute mystery. But as I said, it was the fact that this guy, it was, it was I actually was friends with the cousin of the guy whose farmland it was this is many years ago now i must admit but so it was kind of semi first hand story it wasn't like someone sort of vague stranger had told me it was someone who kind of knew the guy and as i said like it was a tumor an ancient burial ground that that had been basically worn down over the centuries by farming and as i said it was literally it was, it was been very heavy rain he said and the ground they turned it over and pulled up a couple of uh, odd artifacts but this skull suddenly emerged now whether it was just maybe a a birth defect and they were frightened by it and they buried it in the ground. I don't know, you know, no, no idea. Mm-hmm. But as I say, the fact it was shown to the police and that was the last I've ever seen of it because obviously you have to inform the police in case it's a more recent death and perhaps there's been a murder or something. But that was the last you ever heard of it. It just was taken away and never seen again. Uh, mm-hmm. Donna, is there anything else that uh, that we should know about before we close for the night? No, other than um, stay tuned for next year because um, I'm always looking for um, anyone who has a dogman or a Bigfoot sighting or any kind of sighting. Um, and I hope to um, bring them along to the next conference. And um, I'd love to have you come out anytime and let's go. I, I have a couple of places that um, there have been very recent sightings. Um, Uh, near Bray Road, and I'm always looking for eyewitnesses, so if anybody um, have seen anything, please get a hold of me, and um, I can't wait till the next conference, and I I welcome you guys out here, and I'd love to see you, and let's go on an investigation. I I would love to do it, and also I appreciate you asking me back for the next conference, so make sure you stay alive and well and healthy, or I won't be able to talk to anybody. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> but uh and, and hopefully brandy will come up and and help me at my table again i would love to yes please um and and, and tell us uh you've got some uh facebook pages and so forth ways people can contact you yep uh facebook page beast of bray road and then i also have uh southern wisconsin's wild ones ohio michigan and illinois um, or just contact me, Donna Wells Fink. And I have the YouTube channel uh, where I interview eyewitnesses um, about any kind of paranormal sighting. So um, join me there. And you know, uh, uh, Brandy, any other closing remarks? No, I'm just fascinated. It, it was very interesting. I, I know Donna has a lot more stories yes. to tell. So. Well, 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 we'll have to have you back sometime. Well, thank and, you. Uh, uh, and especially after, uh, you know, we don't know about the uh, uh, the Pine Bush, Pine Bush, a uh, Pine Barrens investigation with uh, Eric and Dominic. So uh, when they stop tormenting me and, and completely <laughs> spill the whole, yeah, you got anyway. Seriously, people, you should watch this uh, video that they've done. It's on their YouTube channel, Bucks County paranormal investigations and uh you'll see donna there being interviewed you'll see the uh uh you'll see three of them three of the bucks county's people out there on lee hample's property and uh they had some interesting experiences with the uh the drone and so forth definitely worth watching but let me i wanted to quote uh from the mothman prophecies john keel as we we close up uh where keel says this is toward the end of the mothman prophecies Mm -hmm. he talks about gradually all these men are being drawn closer and closer to ontology which is a branch of metaphysics that deals with the nature of being and he says to an examination of the question that lies beyond the the simplistic can these things be the real question is why are there these things which we have tried to wrestle with a little bit tonight and don't really know of course keel didn't know either so that that gives me some comfort but uh donna thank you so much for being on tonight thank you and Thank I knew you. this was going to be a great, uh, great episode. And Andy and Brandy, I'm really glad that uh, Andy was having some uh, audio difficulties, which is, mm-hmm. uh, and, 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 and so Andy knows whenever I have a technical difficulty, I cry like a little girl. And I go, <laughs> Andy, Andy, you've got to help me here. I don't know what's going on. So, but Andy can figure these things out. So he, he, he dries my tears and says, don't worry, Steve, we can fix it, which is always good. He can good. do it. it can and, be done. Uh, 
and uh, and Brandy, hopefully, maybe maybe someday uh, we can journey up that way and spend a night vigil in one of Donna's uh, secret uh, uh, high strangeness areas. Yes. I would love it. Yes. Well. Well, in, in all seriousness, let's plan that sometime. So I'm going to close out the show. Everybody sit tight. I'd like to talk to everybody afterwards a little bit. The High Strangeness Factor was created by Steve Ward and Andy Mercer and is copyrighted on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. I want to thank our fearless leaders here at the network, Irene Ellen Block and Mark Johnson. I also want to thank Andy Mercer, who does double duty as regular co-host and producer. And also Brian Zeller, who composed the original music for the show. I can also be heard weekly on Mac Maloney's Military X-Files as a correspondent on this same network and other platforms. And I am Steve Ward, your humble host here on the High Strangeness Factor, a displaced yank here on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Thank you for listening. I will see you all again in a fortnight. Take care.